Okay, so Mahabhan uh, asked the question, what happens to P removed with the polymer, and where do we put it? So I am going to have Catherine come off mute and go ahead and take a stab at that since they did the work there at Virginia Tech. Catherine, sure. you yep. Yes, sir. Um, Muhammad, the phosphorus obviously does not disappear. Um, it is uh, coagulated and then precipitates in the manure system. And uh, what we did essentially is we then advanced, we, so we we had two levels, um, two layers in the manure handling system, a very clear supernatant on top and a very concentrated sludge on the bottom. Uh, we just advanced, we had a second tank, we advanced the clear liquid um, to the second tank, pumped the sludge out, and we land applied it. Uh, the benefit was that we had a much reduced volume that captured 90 or 95 percent of the phosphorus. So our transport costs to uh, land apply were lower. Basically, we needed to take it about five miles away from our campus farm to find land that was low in phosphorus. Um, and so for us, the economics were the balance between the cost of the additives and the savings in trucking. Uh, that phosphorus is still land applied, um, still you, you need to find a home for it. It's just a question of concentrating it so you have reduced trucking costs. So uh, I'll add on to that question, um, Catherine. So it's uh, the end product uh, is a material that's, uh, I'll, I'll use the term sludgy, but um, it's relatively available then for plant uh, utilization. There's no issues there in that regard. <laughs> that's that's right, and that's something that I, I wondered a lot about when I first started. We think of aluminum, you know, tying up phosphorus, but uh, my agronomy uh, buddies and Rory McGuire, specifically a collaborator on this, reminded me that there's so so much uh, aluminum already in the soil that the amount of aluminum that we're adding, um, or iron, if we're using a ferric chloride additive, the amount of iron or aluminum that we're adding in the manure is just minuscule compared to what the manure phosphorus would normally be exposed to in the soil. So there's no real change in the availability of that phosphorus to plants. Okay, thanks. Um, I noticed there was one more question that I see was uh, being sent in by Guiling Ma. But I don't see it showing up in our chat box. Any other questions from the group? Okay, so Mohammed says thanks. Apparently the answer that she gave Catherine uh, did a good job answering that. Other questions that might come in from the group? Okay, message coming in from Leslie here. And Steve's typing, so. And there may be a slight delay between uh, all this linking in through all the computer systems and finally showing up on my chat screen. Um, as Leslie mentioned here, if you have other questions, you can feel free to contact any of us directly by email. Um, so Gui Ling wanted to know a bit more about the P removal. Um, anything specifically that you were interested in, Gui Ling? Um, not sure what else to share. Um, the technologies are both uh, essentially available to dairies. I, I will say that um, we are planning a series of webcasts that will begin in uh, November, and it's at least at this point going to be a two-month series <clears throat> looking at nutrient recovery technologies um, for manure. So I think more information about both of these technologies and some additional ones in November and December of this year, so I think that's probably the the most appropriate time to, to get those additional details out. Um, okay, so Guilin was asking whether alum and polymer is a popular method. So what's your sense, um, Catherine, of uh, the adoption level of this out there in the industry at this point? Sure, it's a, these are approaches that are widely used in wastewater treatment, widely used on swine farms, not widely used yet on dairy farms. 
Um, I don't know of application of this. I know of some companies that are packaging um, together some of these chemicals with some of their mechanical manure separators and selling and promoting them as a system uh, to remove phosphorus. I will say that one thing I really like about the chemical and uh, flocculants or polymer combination is that you can use it both ways. If, you, if you're building a new dairy or have the space, you can set up a system that will treat the manure as it comes out of the barn every day. So little bits of chemical each day um, and then separating out the solids and diverting the solids, the high phosphorus solids one way. It, it, it dramatically increases the effectiveness of solid separation if that's how you choose to use it. But it's also useful for farms like ours or smaller farms where Maybe once a year or so, you really need to clean out. Um, you've got solids accumulating in the bottom of the manure pit. Um, it, it's suitable for spot treatment also. We just literally brought the it truck onto the farm and, you know, dispensed the uh, chemical into the manure pit, agitated, uh, dispensed, agitated it, let it sit for 24 to 48 hours, then moved the clean water on and pumped the sludge out. So it's useful both ways. Okay. Um I've got two more questions here I think we'll try to take uh, today. Um, one of them I'll direct to uh, Mark and Bob. The question is, is there any new info or thoughts about managing phosphorus in our large calf operations? So my sense would be there uh, probably relates to, is there any particular way that you would like to uh, balance diets, feed ingredients to, to help uh, manage that phosphorus? Because obviously we aren't exporting any phosphorus off the farm and milk with those calves. So, Mark or Bob? I'll let Bob on mute. We'll come off. And well, yeah, I guess there are two things. First of all, you have, and, we, and we've done some milk, some, some work on this. I want to ask Catherine if she could chime in here in a little bit. But when we look at our alter, alternatives on the milk-fed calf, there's not a lot we can do in terms of dietary manipulation. Uh, when you look at, at the calf starter side of things, um, there are some limited things there. And I think when you look at, at supplementation of those diets, um, the, they're predominantly corn, uh, soy. We start looking at some of those byproduct feeds to, to lower the ration cost. And I think there are, are a couple of considerations. First of all, you look at some of the availability of phosphorus in those um, ingredients, and it is a little bit lower. And so I think there's some concern there that we meet the phosphorus requirements. And this is other pretty young animals that we're dealing with here, recently weaned. They may be two, three, maybe four months old. Uh, I don't know that we have any real indication of what availability is in those young animals, but I think the, the logic would be that there's a little bit more stress um, in terms of, of uh, balance in those animals, and uh, but w we do have some limitations. And I'll let Catherine go ahead and weigh in on on what we found in some of our balance work with uh, with the the calves here at Virginia Tech. Yeah, I'll chime in uh, briefly to make two two points. The first is that uh, in some research that we published, uh, JDS two thousand and eight, and Stephanie Hill was the lead author on that. We found no change in phosphorus excretion or digestibility between calves that were fed kind of a traditional 2020 milk replacer, pound of powder per calf per day, versus calves fed higher protein, higher fat. Uh, higher protein uh, milk replacers, a higher protein, high fat milk replacer, and then a higher protein, high fat milk replacer fed at, at uh, quite a uh, high feeding rate. No change in fecal phosphorus and phosphorus digestibility. Obviously, though, those high fed calves were getting more phosphorus. So phosphorus retention was greater on the calves fed those accelerated calf starters. So with the, these accelerated calf start, calf, I'm sorry, accelerated milk replacers, we saw improved phosphorus retention. So there's, there's a key, support the overall nutrition and aggressive growth of the calf improves phosphorus retention and, and reduces the proportion that goes out in manure, if, even if not the absolute amount. A second, and I, this, is, this is a key point that I, I think needs uh, to focus on, and that is that we're talking about such small quantities. Um, the federal CAFO regulations um, talk about uh, CAFO being, what is it, Bob, you know, 1,000 calves. Well, what we have calculated is that on a nitrogen and phosphorus basis, um, the, to equal a 700 cow CAFO is 
12,000 calves, if, you, if you're looking at it on a nitrogen basis, so 12,000 calves um, excrete the same amount of total nitrogen as 700 lactating cows. 17,000 calves to excrete the amount of phosphorus that 700 lactating cows do. So our CAFO regulations at this point are not parallel between our, our calf operations and our cow operations. Okay. Well, we are um, gone pretty long today, and I think we've addressed most of the questions fairly well. Um, so I think we are going to call it quits. Thank everybody for their attendance today. Um, know that we're going to continue some pretty heavy uh, emphasis on nutrient management uh, the remainder of 2013. And if you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to contact any of the authors or any of the presenters today. Um, and we hope to see you again in the future. And thank you.